So let me say first this morning that it's a great honor and privilege to be with you this morning and to be with you again next week to share in this ministry of the gospel that we that we do together. Kathy and I joined Salem initially several years ago because we had moved to Lenexa and because we had known Pastor Dave Wetter for some time. We choose to stay at Salem and make it our faith community because we feel like we have been welcomed here. We find the worship here to be inspiring. We find the fellowship that we have with so many of you to be a source of, of life. We appreciate the educational opportunities that are here. Perhaps above all, we are drawn by the strong missional sense here at Salem that Salem is not just a community closed in on itself, but we are a community that seeks to go out and make a difference. Obviously, we think of the pantry pack, and we think of serving at the gathering table in Kansas City. We think about the way Salem has reached out to connect with our Muslim brothers and sisters. We think about how Salem is a reconciling community, reaching out to the LGBTQ community so that they feel welcome here. I think about the summer we spent, some of us thinking about issues related to immigration and what our call might be. So there's much to celebrate here at Salem, and Kathy and I are very pleased to be part of this community. Let me also say a word about what it is I think I'm doing here when I do this preaching thing. And this is dangerous because you know I'm a professor and I could talk for an hour on the nature of preaching, but I, I won't do that because I know you walk out. So, But just a, a little word. I like to think about the difference between objective knowledge and subjective knowledge. Objective knowledge is knowledge about the world out there, the world that we experience together. And objective knowledge is really important, especially when we think about um, knowledge that's verified scientifically so that we know it's true. We have to pay attention to the consensus that science presents to us. That objective kind of knowledge is important, but preaching is about subjective knowledge. It's about the knowledge we have of ourselves and who we are. It's that knowledge of the heart that Emily was talking about in the children's time. It's knowing who we are and what's going on with us and who we are called to be and seeking to be, seeking to become our true selves. So, in my view, preaching is about that kind of subjective knowledge, inspiring us, hopefully, and challenging us sometimes to Think about who we are and who we're called to be and what we might need to do to change our lives, to change what we do, to change how we do things. And then one little quick Lutheran moment. We do these things. We seek to be, become the, God, the people God calls us to be, not in order to gain acceptance from God, but because we know we are accepted by God. 
we have known the unconditional love of God in Jesus Christ. That God will love us no matter what. And that frees us. We don't have to worry about whether God's love is there for us or not. And so we are free to seek to become the people God calls us to be, knowing we will make some mistakes. There will be some wrong turns along the way. So we have before us a very difficult gospel text this time. Jesus addressing his disciples and telling them, you need to hate the members of your family if you're going to follow me. You need to count the cost and decide if you can really do it, if you can really follow me. You need to take up your cross. And maybe the most hard one of all, you need to leave all, leave all your possessions behind. What are we to do with this, these impossible demands of Jesus? If we think about the history of the church, we can find a variety of different ways that people have sought to live out these very challenging commands. And I'd like to tell you about one community in our Kansas City area that seeks to live out these very hard commands of Jesus. I lift up this community not because they're perfect, but because they might inspire us to think about how we can respond to these commands. The community I'm thinking about is called Cherith Brook Catholic Worker House. And it's in Northeast Kansas City, not far from the gathering table, the former Children's Memorial Lutheran Church. And as you probably know, that's a pretty tough neighborhood there in Northeast Kansas City. And there is where Cherith Brook Catholic Worker House uh, lives and does its ministry. Cherith Brook is named after a biblical figure, a biblical place. The Cherith Brook is where the prophet Elijah was told to go by God to hide because God had told Elijah that there will be three years of drought and the drought won't end until you say so. And so you need to go hide and so Elijah went and he hid by the Cherith Brook and God said you can drink the water of the brook and every morning and every evening I will send ravens to you and they will bring you meat and they will bring you bread. So Cherith Brook was kind of a hidden, desolate place, but it was also for Elijah a sanctuary. So Cherith Brook the community took its name from this biblical place of sanctuary. The Cherith Brook Catholic Worker Community is a community of voluntary poverty. The individuals who are part of that community have very few personal positions, possessions. They have a common purse. Each person works part-time, and they put the money into the common purse, and they manage their lives together out of that common purse. So they live this form 
of voluntary poverty in a very impoverished community. And they seek to be in ministry, they seek to be in community with the poor and homeless people who live around them. In, in Northeast Kansas City, Cherith Brook is known as the shower house because one of their really important ministries, a couple days a week, they have, they offer free meals, breakfast, breakfast, and people come in and can have breakfast, and then they can sign up, and they can take a shower, and they can receive a clean pair, a clean set of, of clothing. You think about people who live on the street, especially in the summer months, a shower is something that they want desperately. And so, Cherith Brook seeks to be in community with these people on the street, believing that being in community with these street people teaches them a lot about how they should live. And so they share a table with these folks from the street, they pray with them, they get to know them, get to know the individuals who are there. They live this life of voluntary poverty and service and in many ways seeking to live out this kind of very challenging command that we have from Jesus this morning. Cherith Brook is part of this Catholic worker tradition, and part of the Catholic worker tradition is a deep commitment to peacemaking and to pacifism. And they are especially concerned about nuclear weapons. Finding nuclear weapons are immoral because they don't have the capacity to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. And so, as we know, the only use ever of nuclear weapons in Japan at the end of World War II, thousands of civilians were killed. So part of what <coughs> Jared Brook members have done at points has, has been to protest against uh, several years ago the building of a plant in South Kansas City that was uh, going to make, produce uh, elements for nuclear weapons. And that is part of their commitment. Some of them have spent time in jail as a result of their protests. Again, I lift up Cherith Brook, not because they're perfect, not because we will agree with everything they do, but I think about them because they challenge me. They challenge me to think about how can I live a kinder life? How can I live a life that promotes peace and justice for all people? How can I take a look at my possessions and consider whether I have my possessions or whether my possessions possess me? That, I think, is part of our call in our Christian life and our Christian walk, to look at our lives and consider how we might be more intentional disciples of Jesus. These impossible commands have often been interpreted in the history of the church by faithful Christians as finding ways to be detached from self 
selfish desire. Finding ways not to be selfish. We are to love ourselves, to be sure, as Emily said, we love God, we are to love ourselves, but we are not to be selfish. There's so much in the world that is good, and God smiles when we take pleasure in things that are good. The beauty of the North Woods the feeling we get when we sing good music, the pleasure of sharing a good meal with friends, the fun of laughing and joking together, all of those are good things, and God does smile when we experience them. But if any of those things or our possessions come to dominate our lives, they are a problem. And we have perhaps become turned in ourselves, turned in on ourselves. We have become selfish. And so we might be called to seek this kind of detachment from selfish desires so that we can have space in our lives to love God to love our neighbor. Today is our God's work, our hands Sunday. And so one of the things Salem does for us, it gives us opportunities to show love for our neighbor in very concrete ways. To make a difference in people's lives. So we embrace this opportunity, and I invite you to think this week about those of you who are able to participate in today's service, to think about what that's like for you, what that does for you. And I challenge you this week to think about your possessions. Think about your relationship to them and consider whether you need to rethink that in some way. To think about this question of selfish desires. And think about the ways that that may be hard for you or places in your life where it's difficult to get away from those selfish desires. We claim God's blessing today for we have gathered in the name of Jesus. And I pray our blessing as we go from here as we seek to live out our lives as faithful followers of Jesus who are called to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name.